Welcome back to First Year Undergraduate Microeconomics. In this video, we're going to look at the Australian iron ore mining boom, the 2000s, and apply our perfectly competitive market model to see why the boom crashed around 2014-2015 and why that was inevitable. First, let's look at some facts. Now, the diagram here shows world iron ore prices. You'll notice that from about 1980 to 2004, world iron ore prices are pretty flat in nominal terms, at around 40 US dollars per tonne. And they're actually falling once you adjust for inflation. That's what the real line means. Then, around 2004, the price starts going up. And it goes up to about $140 US per tonne in 2009. Then has a bit of a fall, which you can see on the diagram. And then off this diagram, it starts rising again. And goes up to about $140 US a tonne again in 2011, before really starting a decline. And it just steadily declines until, well, today, as I'm making this video, in March in 2015, where the headlines announced that the iron ore price has just gone below $50 US per tonne again, for the first time since the mid-2000s. Uh, mid so what's been happening with quantity? Well, quantity's also been fairly flat throughout the 1980s and 1990s, at about 1 billion tonnes of iron ore produced worldwide each year. Then around 2002 to 2004, production starts to rise. It goes up to about 2.5 billion tonnes in 2010, and it just keeps going. So production has risen throughout the 2000s and right up to today, in 2015. So the price went up and down, but output has kept going up. Needless to say, Iron ore producers are not very happy about this, particularly some of the smaller ones. There's talk of forming an iron ore cartel, the Australian equivalent of the oil cartel, OPEC. And it's illegal, so it probably won't happen. But there's a lot of finger pointing going on. When the price is dropping, why are they keeping on producing so much iron ore? Well, actually, the perfectly competitive market model predicts exactly this cycle that we've seen in iron ore in Australia, and we've seen repeated many times in booms around the world. Let me show you how. First, just let's check our assumptions are reasonable. If we're going to use the perfectly competitive market model, we better make sure it makes sense for the iron ore market. First, note that there are many buyers around the world, and basically most buyers are price takers. On the output side, there are three big producers internationally, Vale, Rio, and BHP Billiton. But there's lots of smaller producers, such as Australia's Fortescue Mining, and many other smaller miners around the world. So even though we've got a couple of big miners, in fact, even those big miners are pretty much price takers. So they tend to take the world prices given. So the perfectly competitive model is a pretty good starting place. Let's start off by looking at the market supply back in 2004. Let's start off by looking at the short run supply curve with a fixed number of iron ore mines. Well, that supply curve's probably going to look something like this. It's going to be reasonably flat and then start jumping up pretty steeply. Why? Well, because the big cost of getting an iron ore mine going is setting up the iron ore mine. Once it's been established, you tend to run it pretty close to capacity. But once it starts reaching capacity, then well, you can't put out much more. So given the number of mines at the market level, you're going to see that same behavior, pretty flat supply until you start hitting the capacity of all the mines. Now, most of the mines are going to be working flat out in long-run equilibrium. So 
we'll expect our demand curve to look say something like that. And we're also going to have a long run supply curve. And the long run supply curve, remember that's going to have a variable number of firms. It's going to look something like this, all going through the same point. So let's just label those curves. So here we've got our supply curve short run at the market. We've got our supply curve long run at the market. And we've got our demand curve. And this is all in 2004. Okay, notice that I've drawn it here with the long run supply curve sloping up. Mines differ from each other. You have cheaper cost mines and you have more expensive mines. Um, so in the long run, when you have entry and exit, you'd expect that curve to be sloping up. Where do we start? Well, we start at the equilibrium of all those curves. So this is going to be, I might change it back. This is going to be our market price in equilibrium in 2004. And this is going to be our quantity in 2004. Okay, so what happens around 2004 to change this equilibrium? Well, China. China goes from being a net exporter of iron ore to being a net importer of iron ore. China is growing very rapidly in this period at around or even above 10% growth in output per year, and it is taking up lots of iron ore. So all of a sudden, from the perspective of the iron ore market, we have a shift in the demand curve out to the right, like this. So we reach a new demand curve, which I'll just label down here as DN for D new. What happens? Well, notice that in the short run, given our number of mines, that's going to lead to a significant price increase. So the first reaction of the market is to move up to this new equilibrium where the new demand crosses the short run supply and that involves a price up here. And I'll label that P short run. And an increase in quantity. Notice that the increase in quantity is relatively small compared to the increase in price, so the increase in price, we go all the way from P0 to PSR, but for quantity we just go from Q0 to QSR. That reflects the fact that the supply curve is pretty steep in the short run. Your mines are operating pretty close to capacity, and it takes quite a few years to bring a new mine into production. So the first effect of the big change in demand is a big spike up in iron ore prices and a bit of an increase in quantity. Exactly what we saw from around 2004 through to around 2009-2011. What's happening at the individual firm or mine level in this short run process? Let's focus on the marginal mine. In other words, the mine that just makes no economic profit in 2004. So let's put our 2004 price on here. So that's P0 again for the 2004 price. And we'll put on the firm's marginal cost. So that's marginal cost for this firm. And we'll put on the average cost for this firm. And we know that the price must just be covering average cost at its profit maximizing production. So this business, this mine, is producing this level of output, little Q naught, little Q because it's an individual mine. And the mine is just not making a loss, it's just not making a profit, it's marginal. Now, what happens when the price goes up? So what happens when the price rises up to our short run equilibrium price? Well, this mine's pretty happy. 
Now it sets marginal revenue, which is the same as price, equal to marginal cost. It's going to increase its production to Q short run by a bit. And it's now going to make some economic profit. And the economic profit is simply going to be given by, well, the difference between average cost at the new level of output and the price at the short run times its quantity. So in fact, let me just uh, label that in there a bit more carefully. So this firm in the short run is going to be making a profit and that profit is going to be given by the shaded area in grey here. So in the short run this has gone from a marginal mine to a mine that is now making economic profits. The problem is that those economic profits for these mines are going to encourage new entry. New firms are going to explore for iron ore deposits and when they find them, they're going to start developing the mines, building the infrastructure to be able to export the iron ore to the world market. And that's going to change the number of iron ore mines producing and is going to move us back towards the long run supply curve. So, now let's see what's happening at the market level. As new firms start to open up, as new mines start to produce, that changes our short run supply curve. It starts to shift the short run supply curve, well, out here to the right. So our new short run supply curve is going to be given by this black dotted line. That process of new mines opening up is what moves us back to the long run. So we reach a new equilibrium where we're back on our red long run supply curve, our new dotted short run supply curve, and our new blue demand curve. We're in a new equilibrium where all of those points meet, and that's going to involve a price down here. Let me mark that on, the new equilibrium price in the long run. I'll label that P long run. And a quantity over here. This diagram gets a little bit messy. But the new quantities here, I'll call that Q long run. So, what can we read off this diagram? What's happened? So in our short run period, 2004 to about 2009, prices went up quite substantially and output rose a bit. That led to mines becoming highly profitable, even those that had only been marginally profitable back in 2004. That encouraged new development of mines, new iron ore mines being built. We had an investment boom in Australia and around the world in iron ore mining. As those new mines come on stream, and it takes perhaps five, six, seven years to get a new iron ore mine up and running, our supply curve shifts out to the right, our short run supply curve shifts out to the right until we reach the new equilibrium. What's the new equilibrium? Well, it again is where the price has dropped back down, output has increased to the point where we have a marginal mine again, where the last mine standing is just not making an economic profit, it's just not making an economic loss. So price has risen, in the early stage of a boom, then starts to fall. Quantity rises a bit in the early stage of a boom, but continues to rise. Even whilst the price is falling, as we move to the long run, the quantity keeps increasing. Why? Well, because it's the increasing quantity, it's the new mines coming into production that drives the price down until we get to our new equilibrium here. So that's exactly what we saw in the Australian iron ore mining boom. But which is the marginal mine? Well, let's go back and look at our mine that was marginal, just not making a profit or a loss in economic terms back in 2004. And that's our mine here, remember? 
the original price, P0, it's just producing and covering average cost. Well, notice that because the price doesn't come all the way back down to P0, this is no longer the marginal mine. The long run price is up here. So this is our price long run. And sure, this mine isn't making as much money as it did in the short run. It's cut its production back a little bit to get back to a long run production, even though total world iron ore production is keeping on increasing at the individual mine level, it's being pulled back a bit. But this mine is still profitable. It's still producing where the price is above the average cost at its optimal level of production. The new marginal mine is going to be a new mine that's got a higher average cost than the old marginal mine. So there's going to be some new mines that have come in that could not operate in 2004. The price was just too low for them, but they do find it profitable to operate in 2015 when the price is a little bit higher. So what's the takeaway from this? Well, the perfectly competitive market model applied to the iron ore industry predicts incredibly accurately the sort of boom and bust that we have seen in iron ore in Australia between 2004 and 2015. The price is getting back towards the 2004 level before the boom, so we're probably getting close to the long run. Some of the incumbent miners are pretty unhappy about this because the prices that they saw during the boom have gone and output has kept on increasing of iron ore. So the boom that we saw in Australian iron ore has sown the seeds of its own destruction. We get this price rise that benefits the existing producers, but as new mines open up, that raises our push and pushes the price back down to the pre-boom levels. And in the long run, output goes up, and the price has gone up, but not by nearly as much as you saw in the middle of the boom. The price has come back much closer to the pre-boom level. Thanks for listening. You've seen now the predictive power of this perfectly competitive market model. It's pretty amazing. Talk to you next time.